Hi, my name is Joe Parr. I'm CEO of Horizon Stewardship. Um, I am thrilled to uh, bring our second uh, webinar in the money and ministry series that we're doing with Cape and Kraus. Uh, I have uh, the pleasure of uh, introducing to you uh, Stan Reef. Stan is a partner at Cape and Kraus. He is a frequent uh, webinar guest with uh, Horizons, and he has invited a new face for us today. Uh, Stan, you want to introduce Dave? Uh, t also, tell us a little bit about yourself. Folks know about me. Uh, let's hear a little bit about you. Okay, Joe, thank you again for the opportunity to uh, join you and your participants today as we talk about a very important topic for churches and ministries. And again, uh, uh, as Joe indicated, my name is Stan. I am a partner with Cape and Kraus, and uh, I'm on the consulting side. So I uh, have the privilege of being what we call the professional practice leader for all of our advisory and consulting services. And I'm really delighted to have my consulting partner, Dave Gunter, who also serves our firm as our uh, chief financial officer. Dave has a lot of experience in uh, the corporate world, having been a publicly traded CFO uh, and doing a lot of work with uh, uh, you know, the SEC and a lot of uh, debt, a lot of uh, capital raising. And he's also an ordained minister, uh, like uh, several of us, and uh, has actually served as an executive pastor of some large influential churches, and certainly has a great understanding all about debt financing and lending readiness. And that's why I thought it'd be very important to have uh, Dave join me uh, today. Thank you, Stan. And yes, it's Dave Gunter. So a little bit of capital markets experience. And in fact, I was a mortgage company CFO back in 2007, 2008, 2009 when the whole market was melting down. So yes, survived and thrived through that time on behalf of shareholders and all interested parties. So yes, thanks for having me aboard today. Well, glad to uh, have you both here. Um, for those of you that are not aware, uh, Cape and Kraus is uh, a, a leader, maybe the largest uh, faith-based uh, and nonprofit focused accounting firms. Um, if you have a good um, uh, CPA uh, that knows and understands church work, that is terrific. If not, um, I would encourage you to uh, give Cape and Kraus uh, uh, a look. They are absolutely terrific. Latrice, why don't you move to the next slide? I want to introduce to you a uh, Horizons resource, Giving 365. This is our online on-demand resource library. Um, it has uh, hundreds of webinars and ebooks and uh, videos, podcasts. This is where we will place the uh, video today. You'll get it emailed to you, uh, but if you're looking for it in the future, it'll be there in our webinars section. Uh, so you'll be able to review the whole of the um, seven series webinar that we're doing. Uh, you can sign up for free access at giving365.com. If you do, you'll also receive um, access to our weekly blog, um, which many folks uh, actually uh, take in the monthly form, uh, where we talk about all things generosity. Before we get into our topic, um, I'm excited to uh, have Stan tell us about a new resource that Cape and Kraus has put out uh, for those who are interested. Joe, well, thank you again. And uh, we really are excited. Uh, Dave and I have co-authored a book that we believe uh, should be in the hands of every church financial leader. And it's called the Church Financial Field Guide. And it's set up, you know, really for uh, anybody that's in financial leadership at the church, whether you know, the CFO or the controller of your church, the uh, director of finance, but it really has some great, great information around things you want to make sure you're doing as that financial leader, or even if you're a board member or uh, an executive pastor, you'll want to make sure you're paying attention to some of these key items. And uh, again, i uh, really delighted that uh, today uh, Dave's able to join me, not only as a co-presenter, but as uh, the co-author of this book that's coming out uh, next month. Well, let's just uh, jump right into it. We're going to be talking about debt and financing. And one of the uh, 
topics that I'm hearing frequently from clients that are trying to decide if now is the time to restructure debt, uh, pay down debt, is what's going to happen with interest rates. And um, I'm going to throw that to you. From your perspective, uh, what are you expecting in terms of interest rates? And for those that uh, haven't been around for a while, how do the interest rates we're at today compare to the historical norms? Joe, great question. And um, I will kick this one over to, to Dave here in just a second. But the reality is, you know, from a very simple perspective, I think we all recognize that interest rates probably will not be going down. They were about as low as they could get without having to pay to put your money in the bank. Um, and so they're, they're, they are going to be increasing. You know, the uh, Federal Reserve has already indicated uh, that there'll probably be some rapid increases to try to offset some of the inflationary pressure that we're starting to experience. Um, certainly, there's some concern of potential stagflation. So uh, we we'll want to make sure we're taking note of that. But it was interesting. Uh, we were in our small group last week and just talking about interest rates, and um, you know, we were all just you know kind of chuckling about. You know, the interest rates are right up 4% and how high that appears. And yet we were all reflecting back uh, to the days when we were buying our first homes at 18% interest. And we thought that was a, a really good deal. So, you know, perspective always helps. But maybe, uh, Dave, give us a little bit more um, real time uh, what you're seeing in the, uh, in the banking world. So I think the most telling sign for me, if we just listen to the headlines or watch the news headlines, a year ago, if we were watching to see what Jerome Powell and the rest of the Fed, Fed were thinking about interest rates, we might have two hikes over the next year. Maybe we'd have three hikes over the next year. And then I remember hearing Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan talking about how many were needed. Very recently, if you listen to, and forgive me, I listen a lot to Squawk Box and CB, CNBC, and they were talking about as many quoting, say, six interest rate hikes over the next year. So if you just listen to the market, the number of hikes is increasing the more people think about it. And there's a lot of moving parts out there. We could all begin talking about inflation, and it's costing a lot of money for gasoline, oil, and anything related to that, building supplies and going to the grocery store. So if we just watch the headlines, the headlines are educating us that we're all realizing, aha, these interest rates today are not going to go lower, they're going to go higher, and they might step up very, very quickly. So that's a nice clue to everybody listening that if you're going to do something, you might want to get ready quickly rather than slowly because the opportunities are diminishing. Dave, um, the, the six interest rate hikes are, are what I've been hearing and, and focused on. Um, that will affect the way that banks lend. Um, we have been seeing um, very low interest rates secured for a long period of time. Um, my background, I was a uh, bank CEO prior to being called into uh, ministry. I know what banks do when uh, rates are rising or they fear rates are rising. Uh, do you want to unpack uh, your experience with that? What can churches expect when they renew their loans in terms of the, the length of time that that interest rate is locked in? So that's a good start. Let's just think about maybe both time and I'm going to say a phrase that's really going to hurt everybody, but the idea of easy money and what easy money might mean euphemistically here would be in recent years, it's easy for people to borrow money. It's easier for churches to borrow money. And what we're missing that we had back in 2007, 8, and 9 were the idea that people who were not qualified were in the market. It's different now. The rules are more stringent. The banks went through a lot of stress testing. That's all different now. And yet, it's easy to get a loan. So let me step out of church world for a second. My wife and I just sold a home here in Georgia. We had 32 offers on that home. The lowest two offers out of the 32 were full price, and it went up from there. But I kid you not, and I use this as a sign of the times, Half of the offers, half of the 32 offers 
were people who wanted to pay 10% down and borrow 90%, like unheard of numbers. And the thought of easy money, cash flow, I'll just borrow. So that gets me back to answering you. People are thinking about, I'll go out 30 years and get the money right now because it's very inexpensive. So it's moving. And the fact that the interest rates are low make people do something right now and you're willing to pay more because of that lower interest rate. But right now, if you did anything where you have a floating interest rate, meaning that your interest rate on your church or your campus or any other debt that you have, if it's floating instead of fixed, here it comes and it's gonna go up and up and up. So locking in a long time now would be a terrific thing to do if a church or a ministry were ready. Um, I see a lot of uh, local banks reluctant to lock in for um, long periods of time for smaller credits. And I'm really thinking credits under $5 million. If you're over $5 million uh, and, and you're a strong borrower, you have a lot of flexibility. But most churches have loans that are smaller than that and tend to see um, uh, their interest rates balloon one, two, uh, three, five years. So uh, that's something to uh, be aware of. While we're, we're talking about debt in general, uh, let's talk about appropriate levels of debt uh, to, to manage, um, whether you're thinking about securing new debt, whether you have existing debt. Um, Stan, as you uh, consult with the church and, and they're having conversations about how much debt um, is appropriate, what counsel do you give them? Well, Joe, that's a really great question. If, if it's okay, I'd like to step back from that question, uh, maybe a year or two. And before we even talk about how much you should be taking on, or is you know, the, maybe the, the, the ceiling, uh, a lot of churches wait too late to even have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've certainly seen this, you know, as you and I have been talking over the last several years on webinars, certainly during the beginning of the, of the pandemic and the uh, uncertainty and how much liquidity did we have and did we have enough operating reserves and did we already have a line of credit or not? And all those volatilities of comes back to, are you even ready for a loan? Are you strong enough? Do you have your finances in order so you can even do ratios to know how much can you afford to take on? Do you know what your giving patterns are? Do you understand the stability of those? Because those are all predictors of how much debt you really can incur. Is your giving going up over time? Are the average gifts going up over time? All these analytics play into your lending readiness and then how much debt can you take on? Because I can give you a ratio, but if your giving patterns, your income is dropping year over year on the trend line, I'm gonna give you a lower number than, than a higher number. And so understanding all of that is critical. Understanding the, um, the psychology or the culture of your congregation is absolutely paramount. Where is your congregation at emotionally, spiritually right now as it relates to any indebtedness? If there's a lot of fear in your congregation still, given uh, the, you know, current realities of you know, coming out of the pandemic and changes in uh, mandates that are you know, being loosened up or sometimes not yet in certain environments, but we have a global war that's erupting, if you will, even though it's just contained geographically, we're all involved in watching the news, creating uncertainty. The economy creates uncertainty. So where's your congregation? And so as a leadership, you want, want to be careful you don't get too far ahead of your congregation. And so I want to give that kind of a, a landscape first. But then, you know, I think, um, and I, I think it'd be great conversation, Joe and David, I'd love to get your, your counsel. But generally speaking, as a firm or, or myself personally as a consultant, I would tell a church very similar to your personal uh, debt management and budgeting that if you get above 30, 33% of your uh, income towards your housing, i.e. occupancy of a building, um, you're, you're getting to the point where you're going to be building poor or debt poor. Uh, you're over leveraged. And so from a church perspective, 
Generally speaking, you want to stay below the 80% of your fixed or semi-fixed costs. Those two are made up of your uh, staffing and uh, salaries, compensation benefits, and your building costs. So those combinations tend to flush out somewhere between 45 and let's call it 50 or 55% for your salaries and compensation. Your building's going to be somewhere between 20 to 30% roughly. And any adjustments in there have to be you know, taken in together or now you don't have really enough flexibility to have that community engagement and ministry that you're really wanting to, to have. So that's a maybe a, a little bit longer way of answering that question. And I've realized there's also some anomalies. If you're a, a, a church plant and you're being subsidized in the beginning, that makes a difference. So you may want to evaluate, do you want to really get into a church building until you're able to support yourself, unless there's a long-term commitment from your network or your denomination, otherwise for uh, unique circumstances. So the life cycle of your church is critical as well into what's the right ratio for you to have as a church in your lending amount. I, you know, I can pause there. Uh, and, you know, Stan, more- let me jump in on, on something that you uh, said. You're, you're essentially talking about how much can you afford and still do your ministries. Uh, and that's going to vary based on what your, um, your fixed costs are. Uh, you mentioned 40 to 45 percent on um, salaries and benefits. Uh, we see that in uh, the healthiest churches, but I would say the typical church out there, particularly um, that is on the smaller end, uh, and particularly in the mainline denominations, uh, we're seeing uh, staffing costs in the 50, 60 percent. If there's a denominational assessment, you take that away, then you take your operating expenses, and suddenly there really is no room uh, for debt. Uh, if I were throwing out a, a rule of thumb, um, I, I encourage churches that um, uh, have that run tight on their operating already, which the majority of churches do, if more than 10% of your um, ministry budget is going to debt, to look carefully to see if you're actually able to fund the ministries that you want to fund, or is that debt standing uh, in the way? Uh, 15% uh, can be manageable, but it hurts. And uh, very few smaller churches, and again, I'm I'm using this term very broadly, 5 million and under for smaller churches, uh, very few can uh, carry more than 15% uh, debt as percent of their ministry budget spending and still do the kind of ministry um, they want. And so um, there are a lot of factors involved uh, into how much you can um, you can afford, uh, one of which is, are, are you planning, to, how are you planning to do that? Because most of Horizon's clients actually don't intend to amortize the debt inside their uh, ministry budget. They just don't have room for it. And so um, what they're doing is funding debt reduction with uh, capital campaigns until it gets at least below that uh, 10% or 5% uh, threshold. I want to, to, to go back to what you said in terms of preparing for either new debt, for a debt um, refinance, um, because it's very likely that um, uh, if you're a church, that is on the horizon. If you have debt, if you're thinking about debt, um, you're going to need to do the preparation. I think the preparation is probably pretty similar. Um, whether you have debt or are thinking about getting debt, um, you mentioned a variety of factors that probably caused a number of our listeners to um, you know, grab their chest. How am I going to uh, do all those assessments? Who's going to do those? Do we have those kind of skill sets? And what resources are available to help guide me. What counsel would you or Dave uh, give in regard to um, assessing all of those pieces and preparing for uh, uh, to present the best 
package to your bank to get the uh, most optimal uh, financing. I think there's a couple things, and I'll let, actually let Dave comment as well here in just a second. Uh, he does a lot of work in that area for us and with us, with our churches. Um, but certainly, uh, I think there's a couple things. One is most churches already have the data. They may just not understand what to do with it or how to organize it. And again, depending on the church, uh, certainly I would encourage, for example, Horizons is a great solution. If you're going to be helping them with a capital campaign anyways, you're going to be looking for this data and helping them understand what they're, uh, you know, what's realistic and being able to raise what's the giving potential in the church, et cetera. Beyond that, certainly, you know, if you've got a CPA that you're working with or a good church accounting uh, professional, uh, they will be able to help you with some of the, this analysis as well, uh, because it's, it's fairly standard within the church world, dealing with contributions and understanding trend lines of income over time. Uh, but certainly, again, like I said, you know, we do a lot of this kind of work. Dave, anything you want to add to that, that part of the conversation specifically? I do. And let me start with a metaphor. I worked for a terrific, brilliant CEO back in my capital markets days. And he would say, Dave, we're going to go ask for money. So we have to dress up. So the same way I might wear cufflinks to go to a banker and look for money and have that kind of discussion, we would take our nonprofit or our church. And in a sense, we want to look as good as we possibly can. So we might clear out the spend and think about, let's get ready by spending only what's necessary, but we may want to cut on committee and leadership, our discretionary spend way down. And two things happen there. We're changing the run rate on our expense ratios and we're elevating the, ba the balance of cash. So just doing those simple things, we start to look more dressed up, if you will, and looking better for a loan. So in a typical lender, they're looking for something called coverage ratio. How much excess cash do you have to fund the debt um, over and above your operating expenses? And the challenge most churches have is that they spend 100% of what comes in. So there is no um, excess cash flow. What do you, how do you counsel churches to um, address that? Now, obviously, you can create the capital, uh, the additional cash by doing a capital campaign. But if a church is um, not interested in doing a capital campaign, um, what do you say to them? Great question, Joe. So, and I would go back to what Dave was just saying. You've got to learn to cut some of your expenses so you create the margin. Because um, you know, if you don't do that, it's just not going to happen. A couple of other things that play into this um, whole dressing up, if you will, is um, we highly recommend that a church, if you want to be serious about uh, raising, you know, getting a loan, you really do need to go out and get a CPA to help you at a minimum do a compilation, which is the least expensive, but it makes sure that your, your financial statements are accurate and everything is in a, a proper uh, format for the banker to see, as Dave was saying, you're putting your best foot forward by making sure your financial statements are accurate and they fit what we call the generally accepted accounting principles or gap accounting. And you can still go with you know, cash basis, but most CPAs, and we would recommend that you would uh, have your CPA convert to what we call the accrual basis, which will again give you a more sophisticated and a stronger uh, look at your financial statements for the bank to review. You want to have a, a strong cash position. You want a strong uh, balance sheet. And Dave, I know you were getting ready to comment on a couple of items as well. So let me give it back to you to, to speak about. Well, I'll pick right up where you are on that strong balance sheet. It goes back to raising the cash that we have on hand. And Joe, your thoughts were so good with so many churches that are spending all that comes in. There's no room in that scenario to look good to a banker. So warning to all of us, we may be coming out of the best of times to borrow money and entering a time that's more difficult. So I don't see a choice outside of controlling spend much more tightly 
as a way to be ready, not only to take on new debt, but just to survive, we don't know what's coming next, but with interest rate hikes, oil prices going up, and then if there's any kind of shock, like we look right now and there's an armed conflict far, far away on the other side of the world, but what are the ripple effects coming this way? And then here comes inflation. So Joe, your advice coming back to you was just so good. We can't spend all the way up. One way to think about this is a common size income statement for everybody listening. If your donations come in, in you measure revenue, if that equals 100%, then we're saying, let's say 50% of every dollar that came in through the offering plate might be salary. Using Stan's numbers, 20 to 30% of every dollar, two dimes, three dimes, a quarter and a nickel coming through might be for the facility, including either your rent or your mortgage. That leaves a couple of dimes to work with, and you might spend that on local and faraway ministry. So getting ready now, I'm going to sound like a CPA and CFO, aren't I? Reduced spending would be the most power, powerful thing, Joe, I think we could do. So there's one other thing I, I want to add in, because this, this ties back to you, but we see a lot of challenges where churches aren't prepared and don't understand, because sometimes banks don't understand. So coming back to having a CPA who will properly prepare your financial statements, and in particular, if there's a capital campaign that's taking place and the funds have started to come in and you're setting those aside as designated or restricted funds, banks don't always understand not-for-profit accounting, that that money that has come in or the revenue that's being uh, coming in on a monthly basis are restricted only for loan payments or the reduction of the loan principal uh, or the down payment. So making sure that you've got someone that understands and is going to draft your financial statements to ensure they're properly noted. Uh, and then again, even the lending, uh, and you can speak far more clearly and eloquently to this, Joe, but I think a lot of churches need to think about who they want to work with because there's going to be denominational entities that they can borrow from that will have a different uh, business model that will help accommodate a church in a different way. But there's also going to be church lenders that are not necessarily denominational. And then there's certainly the traditional bank. All three of them have a little bit different perspective of what they're looking for and what they're willing to work with on a church basis otherwise. So that's a critical piece as well in, in the uh, lending readiness and um, you know, being able to get that loan. I want to, to bring up a couple of points, and then I'm going to loop back to um, resources. One is I think you have accurately said that churches have the data. Um, you're, they're, they're collecting data and, and putting it into the church management system, uh, which typically has an accounting feature uh, either tied to it or embedded in it. Uh, but I see... Uh, a, a real lack of um, understanding on how to draw that information out. Uh, we're going to be doing one of our series is on analytics, where we're going to do a deep dive on, on this. But um, uh, you have the data um, getting at it in helpful ways um, is a key um, and, and, and I'm going to loop back around uh, to the resource side of it, but I also want to say around um, this, uh, this cash flow and coverage ratio. Um, this is uh, uh, back in the day, uh, banks used to lend on asset value, and some of the denominational lenders will still do that, and we actually see um, challenges where they have over lent uh, because there's equity in the property, but they didn't as carefully look at the trends. Um, Horizons, it will be publishing this week, our 2021 uh, worship and uh, giving survey, where we asked churches from all around the country uh, what happened to their giving in 2021, what happened to their worship attendance. But only 34% of churches saw an increase in giving last year, only 34%. So that means, um, in essence, uh, about the same number was flat, 
which if you're just flat, you're losing to inflation, right? Your buying power is going down. And if you are in that uh, roughly third who is in decline, banks are going to run that out. So it's not just where you are. They're going to look at the trend of, of where you're going, and, and that becomes problematic. So a solution um, is a, a capital campaign. That is to create another revenue source that is restricted for that uh, debt payment. And how we approach that at Horizons is with a feasibility study. I know a lot of uh, folks that do this work say, trust God and, and jump in. Uh, maybe it's the banker inside of me, but we do um, a very uh, uh, thorough feasibility study, which starts with helping to develop the case statement, then working through and aligning your ministry and financial leaders around that vision, uh, adjusting, uh, adjusting that, doing a survey of your ministry and financial leaders and interviews, once you're, you're um, uh, where you need to be from that group, because they're going to give the vast majority of your dollars, then um, you do a church-wide education, and then we do a survey of all of that. That feasibility study for us accesses those data points, and the feasibility study itself is something that you can take to a lender to show... Um, uh, this is the expected outcome of a capital campaign, and very frequently they will write a, um, a, a letter uh, basically approving a loan subject to the uh, success of a, of a capital campaign, but that document can help. If you are not uh, involved in a capital campaign um, and, and you've said uh, contact a CPA to make sure your financial statements are in order. There's still this whole idea of how do we assess um, the directionality of it. Uh, I understand that in that ebook that you guys are putting out, you actually have a chapter that deals with this and helps churches um, walk through that. So tell us um, what churches can expect, because I know people are, are furiously uh, writing down notes on, on how to prepare, and I, I think your resource will help them. Um, can you speak to that? Absolutely, and I'll let uh, Dave be thinking about uh, a couple of items that he specializes in as well, but just um, for context, when I talk about having your CPA come in and look at your financials, what we're really saying is look at the historical context because accounting is looking backwards in time at historical transactions. And so that's one piece to understand what has already happened and how did we get to where we're at? Certainly that capital campaign and more specifically, Joe, as you, you've already alluded to, the feasibility study in many ways is more of a finance function. Mm -hmm. uh, what's, what's the church capable of? What's the giving potential in the church? What could we see in the future? And that really is the finance function that in a, in a for-profit setting, that would be what it's called, finance and forecasting. Mm -hmm. That feasibility study uh, within the church setting or not-for-profit when you're saying, if we were to do a capital campaign and create a new revenue stream, how big could that be? But the other important piece that is part of that feasibility study that you mentioned, and I want to really highlight, Joe, is you're actually sitting down with the ministry leaders and the financial leaders to talk about the vision of what we want to accomplish, not just how much money we want to raise. And quite frankly, it's many times it's you and your team, along with anybody else doing capital campaigns, are saying, that's a really, really, really big vision. It's just not doable here now. And you have to kind of bring a little reality back in that, yes, you know what, for church your size, maybe a $5 million campaign is the max. We aren't going to be able to do a $20 million. That's just not realistic. And to your point, um, it's not just the banker in you, Joe, and I respect that. I really do. The preacher in me says, you know, right out of the book of Proverbs, know the condition of your flocks because riches are not forever. Okay, so you better know the condition of your congregation. 
what's available. And it's not just a matter of, hey, we're going to pray it in and we just hope that it comes in. That's really irresponsible. Now, God can show up, but if you don't know what you're capable of and then what that gap is, um, the bank isn't either. <laughs> So, Dave, take, take us home with yeah, some count the cost before you build, I think, was uh, counsel that we find in Proverbs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And the Gospels also speak of that. Absolutely. Okay. So from a resource perspective, um, if, if I am trying to get my head around this, in about three weeks, I'm going to have this Cape and Krause resource, um, which is much broader than just the subject of uh, managing debt, preparing for loans. And so I've got uh, a, a checklist, if you will, of things to think about, steps to take. Uh, to uh, be prepared. Uh, we talked about uh, if you are, uh, if you don't have the margin in your um, ministry budget and you're not willing to make the reductions and expenses that Dave was talking about, then what you've got left is another source of revenue for most churches that's going to look like uh, capital campaign. I want to point out a couple of resources that may be helpful to you um, on our uh, website, horizons.net. Uh, there's an ebook, How to Know If You're Ready for a Capital Campaign, that begins to walk you uh, through that process. You'll also see some ebooks in there, uh, expanding ministry funding uh, and impact through debt reduction. And that goes through six different scenarios of how churches will um, mix and match, uh, because debt campaigns are hard. Uh, and so um, if you are building and you build more than you can pay for, you've got a residual debt, you want to uh, do additional capital campaigns over time with that, it gets harder and harder to do because new people that join your church, they walk in, the building's already built. In fact, the walls are now scuffed. Uh, it's, it's been around for about nine years, and they don't really identify with the, the debt. And so with the exception of about, there's a, about 15% of people in a typical church who are debt adverse. They will pay for debt all the time. Um, they're the ones that are asking you if you have your building fund, they can uh, contribute to but very often, churches that are facing uh, a need to reduce debt, the way to get the most possible money for, for debt is to uh, draw in some additional projects that are uh, appreciated. So um, what happens is you ask your committed core, part of that uh, lead gift development, uh, advance giving development from your committed core, you ask them to uh, uh, focus on the debt portion because they're much more likely to identify with that. And then the uh, attractive pieces, that's how you draw the crowd in. Otherwise, the reason that debt campaigns don't do as well is you have a hard time drawing new members into debt that you incurred uh, 15 years ago, unless they're just one of those 15% who are absolutely debt camp uh, debt. Um, adverse. So that's another uh, resource for you. There's also examples in there of churches that have done debt campaigns, what the experience is like. So those are uh, resources. I'd like to now spend the conversation to talk about what mistakes you see churches tip making in regard to acquiring debt or managing the debt they have? What are the, the common pitfalls and mistakes? Because we may find that some of our listeners uh, can, can realize that that's where they are, and they may not even know uh, that's not a, a position of strength. Dave, why don't you go first? So yes, let me take that. We talked a lot about knowing your expenses and I imagine everybody on church staff can roughly tell you or tell a banker how many pennies on the dollar went out to salary and how many went to facilities. What we haven't discussed today is that part of the readiness and the preparation and part of the conversation with the banker would be, hey, I've got givers. 
not only do I have givers, I've got these two kinds of groups of givers. I've got people who average $5,000 and I've got people who average say 50,000 or more. And the trends inside that would say, I've got people staying for a very long time. I have either a little or a lot of people sneaking out the back door and they don't give again. So knowing those trends put us in a place where we have knowledge and we can talk to the banker. The other way to think about it, if we did it wrong, then we don't know, we can't answer the question. So that's a big mistake, not to be able to give the banker comfort in discussion or say in an exploratory discovery session that there's strength and there's continued giving by large groups of people and you can describe more and more about how they've behaved over time. So big mistake not to know the income numbers as well as you know the expenses. So yeah, some of that. Well, go ahead. I would add a couple of things just uh, from a practical relational side. Too many times a church gets ahead of themselves and goes and talks to the bank before they're ready. Mm -hmm. And they don't put their best foot forward and it's hard to overcome. So if you're just, you know, hey, let me just pull these financial statements out of the system and you run them down there and you don't really understand them and they're, they're wrong. Bankers have a hard time moving past that because that first impression walks in. Beyond that, I've worked with too many organizations that start the process when they're already in a weak financial position of having maybe one or two years of operating losses, but they had the cash to absorb it. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you've had operating losses for a couple of years the bank's not going to be saying, yes, let's, let's let you borrow money because you've already demonstrated either a lack of fiscal responsibility or your trend line's already in bad news and they're not interested in coming in. And so those are just some of the simple mistakes that are really avoidable um, if you would just you know, take the time to think through what does that look like. I think from my perspective, um, when you're doing a debt campaign, uh, that is built on vision. People are investing in the future of the church. So um, a lot of times we'll come in and meet with the church and they're like, well, we need money. We're drawing from our endowments. We're upside down. We need to run uh, a capital campaign. And their reasoning for that is, well, if we just explain that we need the money so that we can pay the light bills, people will uh, invest. And that actually, that sort of thinking is what's driving the declining uh, church giving as a percentage of total giving, because our best donors are actually giving to other places. It's Christians uh, shifting, not non-Christians. Uh, it's Christians who are shifting to, uh, to other places. So having a clear and compelling vision. The second is failing to tell your, your ministry impact stories. Uh, again, this has to do with the, the shift. This affects you operationally uh, in your operational giving uh, and, and in the capital. It is that you've got to demonstrate um, that you are changing lives, that you are a better investment than the nonprofit uh, down the road that they're probably giving to. In fact, your best donors Speaking as a rule, your best donors probably are not giving you the largest share of what they um, are giving away. The, the third thing is a failure to develop relationships with your ministry and financial leaders. Uh, too many pastors are not looking at the giving data. Uh, the Cliff Christopher, who founded Horizons, he was a clergy. He would call that clergy malpractice. Uh, in, he, he was a Methodist, and in the Methodist system, the book of discipline requires the pastor to have access, not only to have access, but to use that data um, and, and, and use it for the spiritual development of people, which is creating um, a culture of generosity. And so if you don't know who the financial leaders are, and you have not been cultivating them, and you have not been drawing them into the vision, then they're probably not ready 
to give to the maximum level that they're capable of um, in a uh, capital campaign. And so this is the reason that we've expanded our feasibility studies to be so much more. We used to go in and sort of test what is, but most churches are so ill-prepared, we find that we need to go uh, to the beginning and work on, get vision clarified, get the, the process, get people uh, telling those ministry impact stories, measuring the effectiveness of uh, their ministries, beginning to engage ministry and financial leaders, um, uh, in developing that uh, vision and sharing uh, what you need to do with them before you're making an ask um, so that they have a chance to, to be engaged. And these, your ministry and financial leaders probably are in, in the typical church today, um, it's not the 80-20 rule anymore. 5% um, of the church is giving, um, of people on your roles, is giving you somewhere between 30 and 50% of your total giving. Um, and, and if you're not there, it just means you're probably uh, an outlier. It's very rare to see more than 15% of of people on the rolls, accounting uh, it taking that largest uh, piece to get to the uh, the fifty percent. Um, in fact, uh, about um, when you're looking at donors, half of the donors across America only give 5% or less of the ministry budget. So it really is the few that are funding the church, and it is that group who will largely get the ball rolling. It's not that you can't engage other people, but they want to see their leaders, uh, those financial and ministry leaders, going first. So if those things haven't been lined up, um, churches will underperform, and, and maybe the last mistake is uh, trying to do, whether you do a campaign yourself, whether you use Horizons, um, it is to omit the spiritual piece of this. Um, it, there are many secular fundraisers that know how to do ask and donor development, but that what we have in the church is the ability to, to draw in the Holy Spirit and prayer into the, uh, into the conversation. So failing to uh, place that in um, your process it is, is going to cause you to um, underperform because people will be giving um, with their head instead of being led by the Spirit um, with their heart. I'm thrilled about the new resource that uh, Cape and Krause is coming out with. Um, it is, it is uh, expected to be a, uh, an incredible tool uh, for churches, and we will certainly uh, be promoting that um, in our Giving 365, uh, in our blogs, and through these webinars. Um, if you would like to uh, contact us, uh, you can uh, reach out to all of us. Um, here is our contact information. Latrice is going to leave that up uh, after we say goodbye to you. It'll just be there for a while. Uh, uh, Stan, Dave, thank you very much for uh, your time. And I look forward to um, hosting you on another uh, of our webinar series. Thank you. Thank you.